Good morning. It's so nice to have each of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Mark. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10. So if you have your your Bible there handy with you this morning, uh, turn to Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 1. We'll begin right there in just a few moments. But let's uh, start out with a word of prayer. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have this morning to come and open your word together. Lord, these these words as that that we read of your teaching are are so beneficial and helpful to us as we as we look at the ways that you spoke to the people of your day. They they apply to us just as much today as they did then. Uh, wonderful words of life, Lord, to teach us how you would have us to live. Uh, the things that you think are important, the things that you think are good for us, and the things, the Lord, that you say are very bad for us. Lord, help us to listen very carefully. Help us to take these things to heart. Help us to apply these things in our lives, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark selected certain events in teachings of Jesus to demonstrate how the Lord was instructing his apostles to conduct themselves as a, a community of believers. After his upcoming death, resurrection, and ascent to heaven. Whenever Jesus went out in public areas, keep this in mind, he always drew a crowd because everyone, had heard of his amazing teaching and of his powerful miracles of healing. Now let's come on down and let's look at a map really quickly. As you can see on the map, Jesus had brought his disciples down out of the area of that was north of Galilee and down it back down into Galilee to their home headquarters of Capernaum. And then he had brought them, was going to bring, go ahead and bring them south into Judea for the Passover celebration. And the way they did that in those days is he would, he would bring them around on the, on the west side of the, Sea of Galilee. This is the way that people in in Galilee normally came to Passover, and that was because they they did not want to travel through Samaria. So what they would do is they would come along the heavily traveled roads on the on the west side, and then they would come down all the way down into the most southern part of of Galilee. And then they would cross over the Jordan and they would come over on the east side of the Jordan and all the way down and go across the Jordan again, cross over to Jericho and then come on down the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. They're actually up the road of Jericho is a long, steep, windy road, a lot of switchbacks and things to come up the hills to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And that was the route that they were taking in this story that Mark is writing about. Passover and in the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the most heavily attended Jewish feast each year. So they were traveling in a very large caravan of Jews heading southward together. And so getting up, Jesus went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, crowds gathered around him again. And according to his custom, he once again began to teach them. Some of the Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. 
Jesus taught on the permanence of marriage in his new in his new community he taught that marriage was a lifelong commitment though in the old testament law there was a provision made for divorce jesus explained that this was because of people's hardened hearts that this was that this provision was even put into the law but he jesus taught of the permanence of marriage and in his new community marriage was always considered a lifelong commitment so now we come down to verse number let's jump down to verse number nine jesus summarized this by saying what therefore god has joined together let no man separate Now let's come on down to verse, jump on down to verse 13. And they were bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus had had entered a house. They had traveled long enough in their journey that they, they came to a place where, where they had to spend the night. And this was still in Galilee, apparently. So they they had a place where they could actually stop at a, a friend or an acquaintance, and they were invited in to spend the night in the house. And so Jesus and his disciples had a meal there in the house. And as they were doing it, people were bringing children to him so he could touch them. But the disciples rebuked them for bringing these children to Jesus. Okay. And this was very common in that day for a well-known rabbi for parents to bring their children and and they would and allow the the rabbi to pronounce a blessing on their children and that when the disciples rebuked them for bringing their children uh the the reason that children of the first century we, we got to understand the psychology involved here. The children in the first century were considered to be blessings from God, yes, as, as we do today, oftentimes. But for a lot of what would probably be the wrong reasons, uh, children were seen largely as assets for labor, as, as sources of potential future wealth, as a, a daughter who would someday receive a dowry, uh, and for sons as the means to carry on the family line. Uh, the worth of children, especially when young, was viewed primarily as the uh, context of the family and the future, rather as individuals with immediate uh, inherent worth. Uh, also, the first century societal norms in the Middle East kept women and children separate from men in public settings, settings especially with respect to religious matters, which was probably being discussed with Jesus at this time because there were scribes and Pharisees that were fought, well, mostly Pharisees because all the scribes had already gone back to Jerusalem for Passover to get ready for that. So these are primarily Pharisees that were following Jesus at this time. So now we come down to when, when, the, when the when the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing the children to Jesus, in verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Okay, he was, we see Jesus actually displaying anger or righteous indignation. We only see this a few times in the Gospels. And he was in other times when we see it, it was in response to the stubborn hearts of people in a synagogue, for example, in Mark 3, 5. Another time in response to buying and selling as people were going in and out of the temple, we'll see in chapter 11 next week, every believer should be like our Lord and becoming indignant at the ungodly or unrighteous behavior, especially of fellow believers. We can expect this of unbelievers but we should not ex we should not be we should not condone it or ignore it if fellow believers are acting these ways okay 
So if you go on in verse 14, Jesus said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Then in saying this, Jesus used a real-time situation as an opportunity to teach about the kingdom of God. Jesus was saying that those who enter God's kingdom must be like these children and come to him, to truly come to him. Also, while God draws each believer to Jesus, we must each still get up and willfully come to him. We must use the faith God gives us in order to receive the grace that he offers to us as a gift. In verse 15, every believer must come to Jesus with humble, trusting dependence and recognition of having received nothing of value or virtue that would earn entry into the kingdom of God. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Neither does the believer need a deep level of understanding about the theology or the doctrine or faith, but only have faith that is childlike, a childlike understanding that he or she is hopelessly lost in personal sin and needs a savior sent from God to bring him or her to salvation. If we refuse to seek and place our faith in Jesus like a trusting child, forsaking all for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, we will never be able to enter into the kingdom of God. We see this spoken so eloquently by Paul as he wrote in Philippians 3, 8. Now let's come down to verse 16. So Jesus took these children in his arms and he began blessing them and laying his hands on them and praying for them. Jesus' actions reinforced what he had just taught. Jesus welcomed all the children who were coming to him in childlike faith and trust, and he prayed for their salvation. Now, let's come down to chapter 10, verse 17. And as he was setting out on a journey, Jesus continues to teach now. He says, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? So this, as as they're as they're taking off again, this man runs up to Jesus and kneels down before him out of respect for his authority. In it tells us in Matthew's version in Matthew nineteen twenty that the man was young, okay, as a young man, and the man we're told in Luke's version in Luke eighteen eighteen that he was a prominent ruler already at a very young age. He was considered a very prominent ruler, probably in the local synagogue. As we can see from the phrasing of his question, we see this from the phrasing of his question. Uh, he believed that he could do something. There was something righteous that he believed he could do to gain eternal life. He was saying, what must I do? do. See that? Good teacher. What must I do? What should I, what should I functionally do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, answered him with the question. First of all, he called him, he called Jesus good teacher. Okay. And he's, and he, and Jesus asked him, why do you 
call me good. No one is good except God alone. Okay, now if he was well-versed scripturally, then he would know that only God is perfectly holy in terms of his righteousness. Okay, that all the rest, every creature has sinned. Okay, and needs forgiveness from sin. Must repent from sin. So, what Jesus was asking is, why do you call me good? Okay, do you, are you realizing that I am from God, that I am the Son of God, that I am God in human flesh and blood? Is there something you're realizing? Are you prepared to acknowledge Jesus's identity anyone desiring eternal life must begin there who do you believe jesus is do you believe that he's the son of god do you believe that he is god in flesh and blood do you believe that he is the only savior that he is the only way to salvation. Okay, so let's go down to verses 19 and 20. So Jesus goes on. He starts from there. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, and the young man said back to Jesus, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth up. Now, if we were perfectly good, we would have no need for a Savior. The Old Testament design, law was not designed by God for us to be able to keep it perfectly so we could save ourselves. The law itself says that, that the only way that we can be saved by works is to keep the law perfectly. And then the law says that nobody has ever done that, nor ever will. Okay, so the Old Testament, Testament law has only one purpose, as we see in Romans 3, 19 through 23. It very powerfully tells us and straightforwardly tells us that the purpose of the law is to show us our sins. Because as hard as we try to keep it, we find out that we do not. And that we fail every single time that we try. Every person does. Okay? It only shows us our sin. The man had been religious all of his life, yes. But he knew in his heart that he needed something more. That's the reason he came to Jesus. Now let's come down to verses 21 and 22. Looking at Jesus, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Jesus said that the man had not kept all the commandments. The man needed to realize his lost state and come to Christ in faith and not in legalism. The man was willing to honor Jesus as a worthy teacher or to perform some religious task as assigned by Jesus, but he was unwilling to make a total commitment to Jesus by laying down 
everything to follow him. This is what Jesus asks each and every one of us to do, to repent of our sins and to lay everything in life down to follow him. Do this and you will be saved. Verse 23, and Jesus looking around said to his disciples, looked around when the man left, he looked at his disciples and he said, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of, the, of, of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We are saved through faith in Jesus Christ alone not through any type or amount of good works. We see that stated so powerfully in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Anything else, including God's law, in which I or you trust other than in Jesus is an obstacle to mine or your salvation. Go to verses 26 and 27. They were even more astonished and said to him, how then can we be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. For all things are possible with God. Entrance into God's kingdom is impossible by means of human will or strength. Salvation is by God's grace alone. The only response acceptable to God is faith in Jesus and the work of Jesus alone. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Let's move on down to Verses 28 through 31. Peter began to say, him, say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Verses 29 through 30. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he, he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus promised, verse 30, to reward us here on earth, but also warns that with these blessings on earth come persecution. But that our real blessing in verse 31 will come in our eternal life. Verse 31, but many who are first will be last and the last first. In eternal life. But those who are first on the earth and wealth and things will be last in God's kingdom. Those who have given up everything for Jesus Christ will be first in his kingdom. Verse 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, they took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen. Then. And saying, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him. 
and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Here are these words that every time Jesus has said this to them before, they have they have refused to hear it. They've 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 walked away and not said anything about it. You notice there's silence here as well. Uh, they 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 don't really want to talk about this. They change the subject, and this is this time. There's no that this time is no exception. Look what happens in the next verse, verse thirty five. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, come up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Now, Jesus knew what they were going to ask. Right? You know that, right? Okay. And they said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. This shows that James and John had great confidence in Jesus and his authority to accomplish whatever he desires. And they knew that in his glory, he would be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They knew that inevitably was going to be the final result for him as the Messiah. It said so in their Old Testament scriptures but not in his first coming. That they didn't understand correctly. They did not understand what was going to happen there. This indicates that James and John believed that Jesus would one day be revealed on earth as a glorious king, probably on the order of David and Solomon. On the other hand, Jesus had just for the third time in a few days told them that they were headed for Jerusalem where he was going to suffer and be crucified killed perhaps one reason mark recorded this incident was so that the readers would understand that the disciples still did not comprehend what jesus meant by these three prophecies after all they wondered how someone with power over the very elements of the earth could be killed they obviously did not realize that it was God's plan for his son Jesus to come to earth in human flesh and blood and to submit himself to murder by sinful men. Matthew's account indicates that it was John's and James's mother who instigated their request in Matthew 20:20. 20, 20. In verse 36, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? By, he, by hearing their request was phrased entirely in the first person. Jesus asked the question in return to allow them to reflect for a moment in, on their question. Jesus always delights to answer the prayer requests of his people. Nevertheless, we who come to him with requests are to always remember that we come humbly and make our petitions not according to our will, but according to God's will. Verse 37, they said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. In the Old Testament, to sit on a king's right hand, at his right hand, was to be in the greatest position of prestige and, and prominence, usually reserved for the king's eldest son. James and John's request was not about their desire to be recognized as especially loyal to Jesus, but rather they were personal being personally and selfishly ambitious. They foresaw only glory for Jesus when he reached Jerusalem. Okay, therefore, they sought the possibility of glory for themselves also as heirs to his power and glory, like Solomon had been to David. Solomon was 
turned out to be the most wealthy king or person who has ever lived on this earth. They loved that idea. But Solomon also turned away from God in the last years of his life and was condemned by God because of that in the scriptures. Go check it out. First Kings chapter 11. Verses 38 and 39. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptized which I am baptized. In less than two weeks time. The apostles of Jesus would graphically witness what is required to be positioned one on the right and one on the left of Jesus. We see it in Mark 15, 27, as he will see two robbers crucified on each side of Jesus as he is crucified. Now, the term the cup is a Jewish metaphor that described either joy or a divine judgment, depending on the context. And we see it all over the Old Testament, Psalm 16, Psalm 23, Psalm 116, Isaiah 51, and Jeremiah 25, just to give you a few examples. In Mark 14, 36, Jesus would drink from the cup to pay the full cost for humanity's sin. He had already told his disciples that this cup would entail insults, torture, cursing, and death. It is a cup that would cost him everything. He would drink from it willingly so others would not have to drink this cup. He would die in my place and in your place. James and John, along with the other disciples of Jesus, though they may have thought they were willing to drink of this cup, they could not because they were not qualified due to their personal sins against the holy God in heaven. They were blemished by their sins and unacceptable to the holy God as the perfect sacrifice for all human sin. Jesus is the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for human sin because he is the sinless son of God. In Old Testament imagery, baptism was a picture of being overcome by tragedy. Okay, did you get that? Baptism was a picture of being overcome by tragedy, an apt description of what Jesus was about to face on the cross. Now we see that, guess where? In the book of Job. One of the greatest examples in the Bible is somebody who was overcome by tragedy. We also see it in Psalm 18 and Isaiah chapter 43. You can go check those out as well. That's Job 22, Psalm 18, and Isaiah 43. The only innocent person who has ever lived on this earth, Jesus, was preparing to accept the wrath of God against personal sins on behalf of every sinner in history. Yet Jesus transformed such tragedy into victory. James and John believed that they were ready to follow his example, but Jesus knew better. In retrospect, we know that in Jerusalem, John would be arrested, imprisoned, and beaten within the next year for his courageous witness to Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior. 
in Acts 4, in, chat, in Acts 5. Okay, now this means he is going to face that same baptism. James would be the first of the apostles to be martyred for his faith in Christ Jesus. In A.D. 44, by the order of Herod Agrippa I, that's written in Acts chapter 12, documented in Acts chapter 12. In his 90s, John would be exiled by the Roman, by the Roman emperor to the Roman penal colony in Patmos in the Aegean Sea by the Roman emperor. And Revelation is documented in Revelation 1.9. Note that the concrete images of drinking from a cup and being baptized are both images connected with two Christian ordinances. The two Christian ordinances. There are only two. Baptize, baptism and the Lord's Supper where Jesus mandates his followers to observe these two ordinances that have as their symbols baptism, being immersed, and drinking from a cup. Okay? The symbolism, don't be lost. Symbolism is, is perfect. Every time a person undergoes Christian baptism or participates in the Lord's Supper, there should be a tangible reminder that Jesus indeed was engulfed in a flood of suffering and drained the cup of God's righteous wrath against human sin. Jesus came to literally lay down his life for every other person who has ever lived. The follower of Jesus should have this same selfless attitude. Without hesitation, James and John glibly agreed to go through whatever Jesus asked of them, saying, we are able. Look at verse 40. Jesus went on to say, but to set at my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. The two sons of Zebedee got an answer, though it was not the one they wanted. Jesus never indicated who would hold the positions of honor requested by James and John. Matthew 20, 23, in Matthew 20, 23, Jesus said to them in the same conversation, my cup you shall drink, but to set on my right and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom I have been, for. I'm sorry, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. There it is right here. I'm sorry. Jesus said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. Jesus did not deny that. Eventually, there will be persons who sit on his right, and on his left. But Jesus reminds us all that our eternal rewards for our service to him on this earth are already set by God, God the Father, according to his perfect eternal plan and his perfect judgment. Okay, now let's come down to verses 41 through 45. Hearing this, the ten, the other ten, began to feel indignant with James and John. I would imagine. The other disciples did not take James and John's request well. The Greek word for indignant indicates a strong sense, a strong sense of annoyance or anger towards someone else. The word even suggests that the ten disciples were angry over a perceived wrong done to them or an insult toward them. Their general attitude reflected jealousy toward the two brothers. Two things are clear about the disciples' indignation. Number one, they all shared the same spiritual blindness as James and John. Number two, 
at that moment they were their indignation was rooted in the fact that each of them longed for those same positions of greatness. They just had not come right out and asked Jesus for it. Okay. <laughs> they they were jealous because they thought they they should have those. Verses 42 through 44. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave to all. Calling them to himself, Jesus wanted to restore a sense of unity among his 12 disciples so he pulled them alone aside to tell them something that he did not want the rest of the people traveling around them to hear you could just see them kind of pulling off from the, from the crowd that's walking along so jesus could talk to them alone the romans dominated the first century world world in that culture positions of authority could be earned by personal achievement but they could also be gained in bribery and personal favors and political schemes and stabbing other people in the back at best power was often passed down within families from one generation to the next the jews viewed the romans and all other non-jews as gentiles and their thinking to be a gentile was to be a pagan However, the pagan, wor pagan world's view of greatness and power had apparently infected the minds of the 12 as well, creating jealousy and competition in place of teamwork and cooperation. Look at verse 42. You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Jesus states the obvious observa observation by all of the way political leadership works. Equating leadership with privilege, domination, and oppression. Seeing power as a way to control those who serve them. This is really important for us to, to realize also. We realize it, but we need to understand that we got to be careful that inside the church that doesn't become the way we operate. Like all other Jews, they were hoping Jesus, the Messiah, would bring them the chance to repay the Romans and other Gentiles for centuries of bondage and oppression. We're not going to get our rewards here. That's not where it's going to happen. This world is absolutely corrupt by sin. But, but the church should be a, different, a, a place that operates differently than that. And when people come to the church, they should see that that's that we operate in a different way. Verses 40, look at 43 and 44. God views authority and greatness through a much different lens, stated as follows by Jesus. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you should be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you should be slave to all. The Greek word translated servant is diakonos. Does it sound familiar? Maybe it sounds a little like deacon. Okay. Literally meaning one who waits on tables. Okay. The Greek term translated slave there. See, I got, do I have an underline? Okay, I, I don't, I didn't underline. I'm not sorry. I should have, but servant and slave is what we're looking at here. Ver, servant in verse 43 and slave in verse 44. The Greek word translated slave is doulos, meaning someone owned by a master. Doulos became widely adopted by Christians in the first century churches who recognized that they were bond servants to Jesus. 
slaves to Jesus. Okay. And so they adopted this, this, this attitude of being a servant to others and a slave to Jesus and doing Jesus's will. In verse 45, Jesus says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature and with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet he did it without sinning. Jesus told his disciples that day that he was giving his life, laying down his life as a ransom for many. Ever since Adam and Eve, all the rest of us, we lay down our lives as a punishment for our sin. Jesus is the only person that ever lived a whole life without sinning and did not deserve to die. And he is willingly laying his life down as a ransom for our sin. You see the point? The Greek word for ransom is litron, which is the word, that, which is the Greek word for the astronomically high price to pay for freedom as a slave in the Roman Empire. An astronomically impossible price to pay a slave no slave had that kind of money it meant that he had to get someone else who was very 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 wealthy to pay the price for him jesus the son of god is that one who is very 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 wealthy and he will pay the price for you because he loves you enough to die for Now let's go down to verses 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. You remember I showed you on the map that that's the last step right as they start going up the hill to Jerusalem to, to get to get into to get in into um, Judea and to get to their final destination. And when they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jericho and his man Bartimaeus, a blind man. Uh, he came, came, came along. He couldn't see, but he heard he heard he heard that it was Jesus the Matt Nazarene who was walking by and began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus had heard of Jesus of Nazareth. And when he heard that he was walking by, he called out, called Jesus son of David. This meant that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And he knew the, the prophecies in the Old Testament in Isaiah, especially in Isaiah ch chapters 9 and 11, that said that the Messiah would be descended from David. Okay, so he calls out to Jesus, calling him the son of David, realizing that he is the Messiah. And when he, when <laughs> he called out to Jesus, he said, have mercy on me. Well, see what look at verse 38. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man and saying to him, Take, take courage, stand up. He's calling to you. Well, come on over here. There's he, he, he hears you. Come on. Come on over. He, see, he hears you. In verse 49, Jesus stopped 
and said, call him. So they called the blind man and said, take courage, stand up, he's calling you. And then in verse 50 and 51, Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus and answered him. Jesus said, what do you want uh, Want me to do for you? And the blind, blind man said, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight, began following him on the road. You see, he had to do he had to do nothing to regain his sight just as we can do nothing to gain our salvation we must simply admit our failure like he admitted his blindness call out to jesus and repent of our sins and believe in him salvation is that simple repent to jesus that you are a sinner and that you need him and call out to him and you will be saved let's pray father we praise your name we thank you for sending your son to pay the price for our sins as a ransom for us to die in our place and the place of each and every one of us personally to pay the price for our sin. Lord Jesus, it is a free gift, a price that we could not pay that you have paid, that you offer up to us as you provided your scriptures, your Old Testament scriptures, the, the law that cannot save us either, but only points to our sins and helps us to realize our sins and then points forward to the Messiah who you are, who was to come, who would pay the price for those sins, such that we might be saved by faith in you. And now, since you've come and have paid those prices, that price with your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead, now we look back to your death and your resurrection, repent of our sins, accept your gift of salvation, and follow you just like Bartimaeus did Lord we thank you for this gift that you've given us we praise you Lord Jesus for all eternity and we ask Lord that you would take our lives and show us Lord Jesus how you would have us live Lord we ask all these things Lord Jesus, in your name, for only you are able. Only you are able to save us, and only you are able to change us from the inside out. Lord, you be glorified with our lives and all we do. And Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. It's good to see all of you guys. I look forward to seeing you guys again here, same time. Same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.